Hello, everybody. This is Christian Cisan coming to you from Studio 66 with Episode 4 of the Third Fridays podcast. Now, I'm sure that the hit rate on the show will go down now that the NCAA tournament is in full swing. Uh, I don't know if anybody's really going to be listening to this instead of watching basketball, or, or maybe that's just me. But I do want to thank you for all the downloads, almost 1,800 and counting. I've also received requests for guest appearances to talk about uh, certain topics, and I guess I get that from a perspective of someone that I've known. I know that they have knowledge on the topic, but for random people that ask me for it, it's kind of weird. I mean, maybe that's a backdoor to getting a job here, in which case I respect you. That's awesome. Um, I'll always put in a good word for the listeners of the show. Uh, Don't be afraid to reach out. Okay, before we dive into today's episode, a little housekeeping. Uh, everybody's still concerned with opioids, the topic of our most popular episode, and we've got more good news. As we sit here today, the board panel has awarded victories to employers and carriers in five out of six administrative appeals. So start those weaning programs. Well, let me be completely uh, fair here. Don't start them yourself. Request a direction for the weaning program, uh, and you're going to be likely to get them approved if you do all the right steps uh, leading up to it. Next, uh, I am holding a live, L-I-V-E, live webinar next Friday, March 24th, which is the second installment of the hashtag Defend From Day One series. Sign up for entry on the Lois LLC website, and I'm sure I can find you a spot. Okay, today we're going to talk about fraud. Helping me will be Yusra Hussein. Welcome, Yusra. Hello. Now, I tabbed Yusra for this episode because last month she presented a riveting discussion (laughs) on fraud at the North Jersey Claims Association. I also have the entire video of the presentation on my phone still, but that's definitely not why you agreed to come on the show, right? Right. That is most certainly not why I agreed, Christian. (laughs) Okay. All right. Yeah. You're more vested in helping our clients learn about fraud. Right. And it's an interesting topic, so I'm happy to be here. Good. Good. Okay, well, loyal listeners of the show will remember that Yusra actually contributed to episode one when she brought forth a court case uh, going against a doctor who had been notoriously prescribing uh, opioid medications. I think his name was Labracus. Yeah, uh, something Labracus, like that. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, yeah. So I was, I was very happy to submit that information and talk about uh, doctors who aren't playing by the rules. Um, so thank you again for that, Yusra. Yep, no problem. Let's dive into fraud. The problem I see with fraud applications these days is that there are way too many of them that don't have merit. And, you know, I guess before my beautiful, charming, talented producer yanks the microphone away from me right now, we here at Lois LLC are the most aggressive advocates of fraud in the entire state. Right. No doubt about that at all. (laughs) (laughs) Right. But I think we can make even more of an impact by doing things a little differently. There is a risk of benefit suspension with fraud, right, that we all know that, and we can use that either either as a leverage tool or to just go for that full home run, but oftentimes claimants see it as an empty threat. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. I mean, the more you raise it, obviously, um, the claimants kind of see it as an empty threat and they'll go forward with it, and it doesn't really work too well in our favor if we don't have um, a really good basis for raising fraud in the first place. Right. If you, if you can't settle it before that first word of testimony comes out, uh, you know, eventually they're going to know the strength of your fraud application, right? So right. Um, we want to make sure that we're, we're making waves in both directions, right? Uh, the fraud claims that don't have merit, we want to conserve legal resources and try to settle it. Um, but the ones that do, we want to investigate them to the same level that our clients would investigate a denied claim, right? right? Um, So how do we determine, user, if a fraud application has merit? Well, I mean, we would have to first look at the statute. And just just briefly, um, the fraud statute is pretty straightforward. It basically says if if for the purposes of obtaining compensation, a claimant knowingly makes a false statement or representation as to a material fact, such person shall be disqualified from receiving any compensation. So there's a few elements there. You have the intent of knowingly making those false statements and um, the material fact, how egregious is is this 
fact or or what they're putting forward um, or not being truthful about. Um, so I think we have to kind of look at those elements separately and and figure it out if we have a really good basis for either raising it or prevailing on it because those are two separate things as well. That's a good thing too. Uh, you know, we, we need to cover all the bases, cross the T's, dot the I's. Uh, so let's talk about some of those important elements. Uh, a false statement or a misrepresentation, misrepresentation uh, mm-hmm. is probably the easiest one. Uh, what's an example of that in, in right. workers' comp? I mean, we, we I see usually, um, you know, if a claimant says something under oath, when you ask them questions and under oath, they say, hey, I'm not working, and then you have video of them working, right? Boom, that's perjury. A, right, yeah. that's, that's really egregious, and I've seen that happen before. Um, the other ones are a little bit more nuanced. If you have uh, a claimant going to your IME doctor and making some sort of statements that aren't particularly true or if you have video surveillance that don't coincide with the statements that the claimant has made, that can also be known as a false statement uh, that was knowingly made. And if that claimant makes those representations to their own doctor, that can also count as well. Good. So, you know, we do have a broad, uh, I guess, base or or a lot of opportunity to find these misrepresentations, uh, but they do have to be material. You said that Mm -hmm. uh, in your recitation of the statute. not everybody's as honest as I am. <laughs> uh, the board isn't going to punish, uh, you know, the little white lies. So right. how do we go about proving materiality? Um, well, I've seen certain situations where our clients want us to raise fraud, where they see in a medical narrative, claimant says he could only walk two blocks and then you have video surveillance of him walking three. And that's just, <laughs> that's just not enough. Um, I know it's not the truth and it's a, a little bit of a fib but at the same time i don't think the judge is going to see that and say yeah i'm going to find fraud in this case because he was able to walk this extra block so uh, we have to look at things like that before we really go for it and um try making this fraud claim right and i think we also need to be careful too uh a lot of times you know investigation reports come in and of course the surveillance companies are going to be very proactive at what they deem to be right. uh, misrepresentations or, you know, he's not walking with a cane today. Or, yeah, or I see that like in investigation that. reports um, all the time. And keep in mind that they're out for their own interest too. They want to prove that they did a good job uh, in catching a guy do something. And we're very grateful for them, but uh, we have to understand that it's a legal definition, right? And we have to be able to prove something that isn't, you know, just the little white lie that uh, comes up or that could very easily be a mistake um, in reporting. You know, like you said, three blocks instead of two, I wouldn't even give uh, two thoughts about it. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's definitely important to uh, assess that. Right. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, knowingly, uh, probably the most diff- difficult element to prove, right? Because right. every, every claimant's going to go into court and saying, but I didn't, I, know didn't know. I, I didn't know I made a material misrepresentation in furtherance of obtaining compensation benefits, right? Right. Like it's Which we've seen numerous times, right? Every time we go to court, we take that fraud testimony and they're like, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. Exactly. And it's- I've even seen claimants <laughs> blame it on their own attorney. Like right, my attorney right. didn't tell I've me seen that this. Too. Mm-hmm. Um, and in, in, a, in a system where uh, the law is, is predisposed to, to ruling for claimants, uh, you know, it it's not it's not a, an easy battle to climb so what uh you know we try to do is that prove that fraudulent act or omission of an act was so egregious enough that a reasonable person would have to know that w- what he or she is getting into right so right. what examples are, are so egregious um i would say definitely when claimants say that they haven't worked since the date of accident and then you find out that they have been working and you have video surveillance of them working or you have you get some sort of wind that you found out that they're working you have proof of it um that's one of the more major ones i've seen and judges more likely than not will rule in our favor for those because the claimant is making money while collecting workers comp benefits so that's a pretty big one. Um, another one I've seen is when um, claimants represent to their doctors that they're totally disabled. They absolutely cannot do anything. And then you have video of them playing soccer on a field or taking some jump shots, you know. So it's it, it, those are more, more likely the ones that you're going to win on fraud. Um, but again, we would have to obviously see what they've said and what they're doing. Right, in order to right. determine that. I think the more the more sexy videos, the <laughs> the 
I guess I, you know, the, the, the more, the videos that have more important or significant fraudulent activity, let's divulge the interests of, of other people here. Um, uh, <laughs> Those are very obvious to our clients, right? They know right. that they're going to 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 have a good shot at uh, prevailing on those things. But I think you touched on a, on an important issue too: is is testifying under oath as to work status. I think a lot of people go in there. Uh, you know, there maybe their hearing is pre conference between the attorney and, and the uh, representative from the employer and carrier, and and it goes through like you know, like nothing ever happened. Like maybe mm-hmm. maybe they don't even walk into the hearing, right? But I think a good opportunity is if you know he's there, make him testify to work status. Mm-hmm. Make him state definitively that he hasn't been working, mm-hmm. that he knows that he is cashing the workers' comp checks because he's supposed to be out of work and that if he ever comes back to work for right. anything at all, mm-hmm. volunteer work, internship, mm-hmm. like you know, helping your family's business out, starting your own business, right. uh, that has to be reported to – uh, everybody to the make carrier, sure that the employer, right, right, mm-hmm. so that everybody knows he's on the yeah, up and up. And I think that's a really important point, Christian, because we do have claimants coming in who were receiving temporary benefit checks and they return to work. And for those two weeks that they return to work, they decide they still want to cash those checks. When they come in, you say, "Hey, you cashed these checks while working." They they say, "I didn't know. I got them, so I just cashed them." So when you make that clear um, in the first uh, hearing or the second hearing, you could say, "Well, we told you if you return to work, you." Can't can't cash these checks. So we told you if you return to work, you have to notify the employer and the insurance carrier. So I think that is actually a very good tactic and a very good way of making sure that these claimants don't get away with collecting benefits while, after they've returned to work. Right. Okay. Excellent. Mm-hmm. The blood is definitely flowing on this third Friday, which can only <laughs> mean one thing. It's time to play Guess the Outcome. <laughs> I oh, sounded no. a little bit too much like a game show host. Um, yeah, what's my prize? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, we'll we'll move past that. But um, you know, guess the outcome is certainly uh, a part of this show, Yusra, and uh, we're going to essentially give you five facts, uh, okay. and you have to decide what how you think the court ruled, whether that be the board panel or the appellate division or even a law judge. Okay. Um, but here we have an appellate division case that is less than four months old, so pretty recent. Oh, good. Okay. Um, fact one, claimant underwent shoulder surgery and collected total disability benefits via judicial direction, so CCP, for about five months. Okay. Uh, the employer secured video surveillance during that time of the claimant mowing the lawn and trimming weeds. Fact three, at an IME, the claimant informed the doctor that he was not presently working at all. Fact four, the claimant testified that he collected his benefits while actively working, doing lawn care for his own business. Fact five, the claimant stated that he understood his representation of work status to only be related to his primary employment, so the named employer, Mm -hmm. and not his own lawn care business. Mm -hmm. Yusra, how do you think the court ruled uh, with a, a set of facts like these? Hmm. I'm always about finding fraud in cases like this, and I hope that the court, uh, you know, was smart about this one and decided that this is a violation of Section 114A, or at least I hope they really did decide that it was a violation (laughs) of 114A. What would be your basis for finding fraud with these set of facts? Like, what would be the reason that... Uh, it may seem obvious, but just right. st- state for well. Our no, audience. I mean, I'm thinking about. It. I'm like, oh my gosh, he did this, 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 and right. this. There must have been fraud. Um, no, there was a few things in that. One, it's uh, the fact that he was receiving benefits, and I'm assuming his doctor was finding him to be totally disabled. Uh, you know, I'll give you that extra sixth <laughs> fact. Um, right. You know, yeah. I'm assuming. But yeah. uh, if he's out there mowing his lawn, he, he obviously isn't totally disabled. So for me, that's a, a level of fraud. Um, the other part is he's making money. He's making money despite whether or not he returned to work with his employer. Um, if he's making money, that counts as compensation. And he shouldn't have been cashing those checks for uh, total disability. Um I think just those two alone, I think that's enough of a basis to find fraud. Well, you're right, Yusra. So that's, oh, good. that makes awesome. it four for four. Um, I'm going to have very to start good. making them very hard. Or maybe I'll bring on a case where a claimant wins. <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe that's it. <laughs> so people come in and, and think that there's another side. Right. Don't this. take us, Christian. <laughs> right. um, but I, I think this case is important because we see the analysis of the, the knowingly element, right? Uh, you know, 
we have a fact here where the claimant comes in and states to the court that reporting his work status to the the IME doctor was only based on his primary employment and not this other side fact. Right. Started, Seems very convenient. Right, I've started a, my own business right. where I'm working and making money from it. Mm-hmm. I'm deciding that I shouldn't report that or, right. or that I don't know that I have to. And I think uh, that level of misrepresentation or, or false statements uh, are so high, so severe – uh, that the court is going to almost attribute that knowingly element to you, whether you come in and say it or not. And and to be honest, if the claimant comes in and says that anyway, it probably right. looks bad for him anyway. Oh, of course, definitely. Okay, so that was Cadra versus Mondelez, 145 AD 3D 1131. For the freaks and geeks out there like me who love looking up legal research, <laughs> um, we can talk about that case uh, as well if you'd like for more info. Um, I think what's actually important about this case, and it wasn't in uh, the facts I gave you, is that the appellate division actually reversed the finding that the claimant wasn't entitled to future wage replacement benefits, although they kept the 114A finding in place because the board didn't give a reason as to why uh, future wage replacement benefits would be uh, rescinded or – Pro- pro- prohibited from from interesting and and I think when I when I read that uh, I saw an, an opportunity for essentially the claimant to bring the case back on calendar right. and request more benefits, more benefits right um, I don't think that's uh, necessarily bad for the ultimate finding of the case because if you have a ruling from the appellate division that one fourteen a exists all I'm going to do there is as uh, you know the defense is is basically ask the judge to give a reasoning for the board. Right. And if, you know, so eventually, I mean, we're going to be suspending benefits. Mm-hmm. And that's appeal. indemnity benefits. Right. That's, that's the other thing good, we want to make clear. That's a good point. Medical right. is still out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and we didn't talk about that. Um, but I wanted to make that clear because this finding makes it probable that a case may not be closed if the board or the judge doesn't issue a reason for finding 114A. So right. to everybody out there, uh, especially our clients, don't uh, just close your file if that's out there. Kind of keep it open just to make sure that it, it's not going to be appealed for a technicality or something like that. Right. Okay. Well, Yusra, it was a pleasure having you on the show. It's great being here. Thank you for coming on. Uh, a reminder to all the Defend from Day One webinar series will release its second installment next week, March 24th, live. Sign up on the on our firm website and throw me some curveball questions. I like the adrenaline rush. <laughs> uh, so see you there for next month and for the next episode of Third Fridays.